Hello. So, you've lined up a very large number of questions today. So, a couple of things. First of all, I have a number of YouTube videos and podcasts lined up. One with Steven Pinker, author of Enlightenment Now. One with Warren Farrell, who wrote a very interesting book called The Boy Crisis, and also a previous book called Why Men Earn More. Um, one with an animator named Nina Paley. Uh, one with a young guy named Charlie Kirk, who has organized a, a large number of campus youth groups, more on the conservative end of things and associated with free will. So all those will be coming out in the next month and a half, I would say. And so thank you for your continued support. It makes all of this possible. And uh, I'm also going on tour. I presume some of you know that. If you go to jordanbpeterson.com and you look up events, you can see where. It's about 40 cities listed so far. Most of them are in the U.S. and a couple in Europe, Iceland, the U.K. Um, but we're announcing, we're going to announce 10 Canadian cities here in the next week as well. So that's all what's going to be happening with me in the next two months. So I'll be on the road with my wife that whole time, sometimes in a plane, you know, just commercial travel, sometimes in a motorhome depending on where we're going and how. So I'm looking forward to seeing you if you come out to the events. Um, I've been enjoying them quite a bit. It's good to be able to talk to so many people. So um, 12 Rules for Life has sold about a million copies now. So that's really quite something. And I think we've sold foreign rights in 43 countries. So it'll come out in not quite that many languages, but just about over the next year and a half, something like that. So... All right, so you let's get at it here. Hopefully I can warm up and get my brain going and, and answer some questions. The first one, 343 people have voted this one up. Um, could you please discuss free will and Sam Harris's and others' ideas of its non-existence? Well, that's a good complicated question to kick things off. So I want to tell you a little bit about how to conceptualize free will, I think, first, because it's obvious that we don't have infinite free will. Our, our choice... Our choices are constrained in all sorts of ways. And I think part of the reason that there's a, a continual discussion about free will in the, philosophical <laughs> in the philosophical literature is because just conceptualizing the issue properly is extraordinarily difficult. So I like to think about it, at least in part, the way that you think about a game. You know, if you're playing a game, obviously the game has rules. So if it's a chess game or a basketball game, then there are things that you can do and, and things that you can't do. And, but, and so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a closed world in some sense. But the fact that there are things you can't do when you play a game also seem to open up a universe of possibilities for things that you can do. So chess obviously constrains you to a board and to a certain number of men and to a certain pattern of rules. But the strange thing is, is that when you put in those rules, because rules sound like limits, they sound always like things you can't do. But when you set up a constrained world like that and you lay out a system of rules, what you do is open up an infinity of, of a near infinity of possibilities. Same with music. You know, music has rules, obviously. And, and if you follow the rules, then you can make an infinite variety of music. And so... And so there's a, there's a very interesting dynamic that's hard to understand between constraint and possibility. And there's a deep idea that's associated with that that I read in some Jewish commentary on, on the biblical stories that I, I read a long time ago, um, talking about the relationship between God and man. And the idea was that God, imagine a being with the classical attributes of God, omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence, all-seeing, all-knowing, and all-powerful. What does a being like that lack? And obviously the answer is nothing, right? Because by definition, those three traits provide for absence of limitation. But then that's exactly what's lacking, is limitation. And there's some strange connection between limitation, and, and I was saying, say, limitation that, that's rule-governed, as I mentioned before, and the opening up of possibility. So... 
It isn't necessarily the case that now determin determinism and limitation aren't exactly the same thing, but they're analogous and they need to be discussed together. Okay, so now so that's the first thing is that our whatever our free choice is, it isn't limited. It's or it's limited. It's it's deeply limited. Now, here's another thing. If I take my arm and I go like this, you see, I'll do that again. Now, you see there's a movement like that, and then my hands stop just before my my other hand. Now, it takes a certain amount of time for the neural messages to go from my brain to my arm and back. And the time it takes my hand to go like this and stop is actually shorter than the time it takes a message to get to my brain and back. So what that means is that when I, when I plan this movement, which is called a ballistic movement, it's called a ballistic movement because it's like a bullet. Once you let it go, it's gone. There's no calling it back. I've actually organized the neurological and muscular sequences that enable that action before it's implemented. I set all that up and then it's released and the whole thing cascades. And so once the action has been released, let's say, then I don't really have any free will because I can't stop it. Now, so, so you think about that. It looks like there's a temporal gradient with regards to free will is that as you look out into the future, May, perhaps the farther out you look into the future, um, the farther down the road, let's say, the more free your choices are. But the closer they get to implementation, the more they become deterministic, governed by standard causal processes. And there's some transition point where they change from being what we would describe as choice, that we haven't got to free choice yet, but at least to choice. There's some transition point between that and ballistic movement. Here's another way of thinking about it. Like we know, for example, that people who are expert at playing the piano look ahead of where they're playing. And, and they're doing the same thing. They're watching the notes. They're seeing where they're going. But, and then they're disinhibiting the automated structures that enable them to play what they've practiced so thoroughly. They're disinhibiting those structures. And then they go automatically. And then what happens if you make a mistake is that consciousness notes the error and then unpacks the motor sequences that have been practiced. And then you repractice them and sequence them again until they become automatic and deterministic. So there's choice in that you're reading ahead, but there's no choice in that once you've read ahead and disinhibited the actions, then they run ballistically. And then you can think about the same thing that's happening when you're driving in a car. You don't look right in front of you when you're driving a car because whatever is right in front of you, if you're going 40 miles an hour or whatever, you've already run over. You look a quarter of a mile down the road and that gives you the opportunity to see what's coming and to set up a sequence of increasingly automated movements that culminate in whatever it is that you're doing while you're driving. And so there's a gradation from choice to determinism, a temporal gradation. And, and I, I don't often see that addressed when people talk about free will. Now, Sam's issue with free will is that if you get someone to do something like lift their finger and you, and you scan their brains using a variety of techniques while they're doing that, what you'll see is that there's an action potential that emer and you ask them to voluntarily move their finger. So they're doing it, let's say, by free choice. There's an action potential that you, can re that you can read off the brain that occurs before the person either moves their finger or, let's say, decides to move their finger. And that occurs quite a bit before the feeling of voluntarism or that voluntary act. And so that's been read by Benjamin Libet, who did the experiments, um, as indication that even the feeling of voluntary choice is determined. But I don't think that that's a very useful way of addressing the issue because the the issue of when you lift your finger in up again is it, it requires pre-programming to disinhibit like you know how to do this right you don't have to learn to do that so you have a little automated circuit that does this sort of thing all these finger movements and everything you can see babies practicing them and they develop automated circuitry that tends to be posterior left hemisphere in order to run those those automated processes out and what you're basically doing when you decide to do something that's a routine that you've already practiced or, or made out of subroutines that you've already practiced is disinhibiting them. And the, the degree to which you might regard that as free exactly is unclear as are the temporal limitations. So I don't think that Libet's experiments 
demonstrate conclusively that there's no such thing as free will, even though there are action potentials that indicate that there is brain activity signaling even the onset of a voluntary choice, um, uh, voluntary choice early. Now, um, another thing that we might look at in relationship to that is, um, yeah, so we can look at it phenomenologically and we could also look at it in, in, in relationship to how people treat one another. So phenomenologically, it seems clear that we have free choice and it isn't obvious to me why we have consciousness if free choice isn't real because consciousness looks to me like a mechanism that deals with potential before it's transformed into actuality, let's say. And, and I think consciousness is also the, the faculty, so to speak, or a manifestation of the faculty that enables us to pre-program deterministic actions. So again, let's think about someone playing the piano. They're practicing, you know, after you repeat and you repeat your, your finger movements if you're playing the piano, any complex motor skill is like that. You have to repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. And you're using consciousness to program it, to sequence the motor movements and to pay attention to them. That all seems voluntary and it involves the activation of a tremendous amount of your brain because if you're doing something new, a lot of your brain is activated. And then as you practice it, the amount of brain that's activated decreases. It shifts from right to left and then it shifts from frontal to posterior and a smaller and smaller area. So what's happening is that consciousness is creating little machines in the back of your head that do things in an automated manner. And the 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 volun the consciousness looks like consciousness appears and feels that would be the phenomenological end as if it's doing that voluntarily and it is associated with a different pattern of brain activity. And so Okay, so there's that. There's the phenomenological reality of voluntary choice and effort as well because conscious programming of that sort is also effortful. It doesn't seem to run deterministically like a clock does. And then finally, there's also, and I don't know what you think about this with regards to evidence, but what constitutes evidence is not always that easy to determine even in, in the scientific domain. So think about how we think about ourselves and other people and how we treat ourselves and other people. You can imagine that you're like a clock running down and that's like a deterministic model, but people aren't clocks. We're dissipative structures. A clock is something that runs downhill, but human beings, you can look up dissipative structure. I think that was an idea that was first formulated by the physicist Schrodinger. We we're, 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 not, we're not clocks by any stretch of the imagination. And we take energy in and we disperse energy. And, and we, we're anti-entropic in, in, in a temporary sense. So that makes us, and, and, so, and life is as well. Schrodinger wrote about that in a book called What is Life? And we don't, what we seem to do, this is how it looks to me. We don't contend with the present and we're not driven by the past. Instead, what we see in front of us is a landscape of possibility. And in my wilder moments, I think that's associated with the physical idea of multiple universes, but that's in my wilder moments. It's just a speculation. And so what we see in front of us is a, an array of potential universes. And those are the universes that we could bring about as a consequence of our actions. And, it, and we make choices to the right or the left. There's, a lot of mythological speculation about that sort of idea too in, in an ethical sense because we decide what sort of reality that we want to bring into being and so we encounter potential like God did at the beginning of time when he made order out of chaos. Chaos is this chaotic potential. We confront chaotic potential with our consciousness and we cast that into reality and that now then you think well is that really the case? Well that's hard to say because there are limits to our knowledge about consciousness and about reality. But if you treat yourself like you're a free moral agent with choice and that you can determine your, the course of your life, then you seem to get along better with yourself and to be less anxious and to be more productive. And if you treat other people like that, that they're free agents that are making voluntary choices about how reality is going to come into being and you reward them when they do it properly and you punish them, uh, or otherwise discipline them when they don't, when they do it badly, then your relationships with them seem to work. And then if we predicate our society 
on the presupposition that each individual human being is capable of doing just that, then we seem to have extremely functional societies. And so, and this is something that Sam Harris has been taken to task for many times, is if you dispense with the idea of free will, how is it you organize your relationship to yourself, your interactions with your family, and your relationships with the broader social community? It's a very complicated issue. So, I believe strongly that we have free will, that we're responsible for our choices. Those choices are constrained in many, many ways. I think there's a gradient of free will from free out into the future to increasingly constrained as the present manifests itself to deterministic in the moment, when, when in the moment of action. We, ent we might think that we enter the realm of deterministic causality at the moment of action, something like that. That's how it looks to me. So, well, so at this rate, we're going to answer about five questions. So, that, But that was a very, very hard one. So anyways, I hope that's helpful. Maelstrom, who is apparently chaos, given the name, asks me, am I chaos or am I order? Well, that's a good question. I would say a lot of the time I'm chaos, but I do everything I can to put things in order. Um, but I'm going to answer that in a deeper way, I would say, because first of all, everything and everyone is chaos and order at the same time. And I don't mean that in a trite sense. I mean it in a technical sense, which is order, technically speaking, in my way of viewing the world, is order is that domain you inhabit, when what you're doing produces the results that you want to have happen. That's a pragmatic perspective from, from a philosophical perspective. It's derived at least in part or is analogous to the pragmatism of people like um, um, C.S. Peirce and William James, the, the, American, the early American pragmatists. Um, and there's a great book on all that if you're interested called The Metaphysical Club. Um, so... Order is where you are when what you're doing is producing the results that you intended. And that validates what you're doing, by the way. That, that's a pragmatic form of truth. Your theory is accurate when, if you enact it, then the results that you intend emerge. That's the definition of truth from a pragmatic perspective. It's a very powerful definition, and it's very much associated with the Darwinian notion of truth. So that's worth, that's worth looking into. Now, obviously, there are times when you implement a plan and a, and a world conception that goes along with that plan and what you wanted didn't happen and so then the domain of chaos comes up the domain of the unpredictable and unexpected and you have to contend with it and sometimes when you um, are acting you do perverse things and things that that surprise you and then things don't work out well for you or or maybe you get a surprise and maybe sometimes that might even be positive and that's because the chaos within you has manifested itself and you've done something that exceeds the bounds of your understanding and you know that can happen to people so badly that they develop post traumatic stress post traumatic stress disorder sometimes soldiers especially naive young soldiers will go on a battlefield and watch themselves do something they can't imagine they're capable of doing and then they have permanent post traumatic stress disorder so there's a chaos within that can manifest itself, that can disrupt whatever order you are. Um, and you know that in minor ways because everybody's always running around doing things that aren't good for them, that they know they shouldn't do and that they can't control. And so there's a chaotic and an orderly aspect to everything, to the individual, to the family, to the social world, to the natural world. It's chaos and order at every level of analysis simultaneously, which is why the Taoists think of the world as made out of yin and yang, which is essentially... Um, analogous to the idea of order and chaos. And now, but then there's an, another element too. So your order and your chaos. And w the place that you live, the environment, is order and chaos as well. But you're also the process that mediates between the two. And what that means is you're the force that confronts chaos and casts it into order. We talked about that in the free will discussion. That's the basis for the dragon myth, or at least part of it, the hero myth. You're the force that confronts chaos and transforms it into habitable order. And there's an idea that if you do that using truthful speech, it's probably the deepest idea in the Bible. If you confront chaos and the unknown using truthful speech, then the order that you produce is good. So that also means that your chaos and order and the process that intermediates between them. And that's really the basis of the hero myth. So part of that is the hero story and the dragon myth 
go out, confront the dragon, get the gold, bring it back, share it with the community. Uh, and the dragon is a representation of that which dwells beyond the confines of the safe and habitable space, right? It's an image of a predator. That's part of what it is, although it's way more complicated than that. And you're also the force that confronts order when it becomes too tyrannical and restructures it back to chaos and then restructures the chaos back into more beneficial order, which is what you do, for example, if you have a, an argument with someone that you settle, right? Because the argument takes the orderly um, relation that you have with that person and then produces a chaotic interlude, which is all the pain that's associated with the argument. And that's a dissolution into what Mircea Eliade called pre-cosmogonic chaos. And out of that, a new order can emerge. And so the best way to construe yourself is not as chaos or as order, but as the process that mediates between them. And that's the basis for the ethos of the West, is that the human being is best represented as the individual, and the individual is that attentive and communicative entity that is continually capable of of mediating properly between chaos and order. Now, this is a deep idea. You could read Maps of Meaning, if you would like. Um, the audio version of that is coming out June 12th, by the way. And I will make a video detailing the relationship between Maps of Meaning and 12 Rules of Life. But you can construe yourself, you should construe yourself as the process that mediates between chaos and order. And you should aim to be the process that does that properly, using truthful communication because that's how you keep the elements of existence properly balanced. And you might say, yeah, but is that real? Well, if you read Maps of Meaning, there's a section on neuropsychology that's also buttressed by a book written by Ian McGilchrist called The Master and His Emissary that lays out the relationship between the right and left hemis hemisphere. Now, it's quite strange that we have a right and left hemisphere. It, it's almost as if we have two consciousnesses dwelling in our, in our, in our, in our being. Um, and they're quite separable. If you cut the corpus callosum that unites the two, then the two hemispheres will act independently to some degree. You can communicate with each of them somewhat independently. So they actually view the world quite differently. And that, that hemispheric distinction is not only there in human beings, but also in animals, a long way down the phylogenetic chain. Now, I made the claim, partly because I was reading a man named uh, Elkhorn and Goldberg, who was a student of Alexander Luria, the most brilliant neuropsychologist of the 20th century. And... And Goldberg made the case that um, the left hemisphere is specialized for, um, for what's known and the right hemisphere is specialized for anomaly. And V.S. Ramachandran, who's a famous neurologist, um, an MD in, in California, has also made a very similar claim based on his analysis of brain-damaged individuals. But Goldberg's case was the left hemisphere is specialized for what you know how to do, and the right hemisphere is specialized for response to what's unknown. And that maps on to this order chaos dimension, right? And the right hemisphere. Now, um, McGilchrist, in his book, The Master and His Emissary, has pointed out quite clearly that the left hemisphere has a tyrannical tendency, which Ramachandran also viewed in his um, brain-damaged patients, by the way, and that the left hemisphere is always trying to impose its logical and restricted order on the world and to make the world fit into that. Now, it has to do that. There's reasons for that. Part of the reason is, is that if your theory you've worked on for 10 years makes one prediction error, you shouldn't throw the whole damn thing out. You should doubt the prediction error, right? Because you never know when your data is actually data or is just another kind of theory. We can't get into that at the moment. Now, um, McGilchrist makes a very strong case and, and I think a more elaborated case than I made in Maps of Meaning, but it's the same argument fundamentally, that the right hemisphere is concerned with reaction to anomaly. And so, so what happens in some sense is something unexpected happens, that's the domain of chaos. And that stops you in your tracks, it freezes you, and that's a predator response, a prey response actually. You're frozen. The unknown has manifested itself. You're not in order anymore. You don't know where you are and you don't know what to do. And so, and you can't just shut down like a computer does. You freeze instead. And then what happens is that the ancient mechanisms that have helped our ancestors for tens of millions of years or perhaps longer than that react to that which lurks beyond the confines of the unknown kick in. And you start, first of all, that's motoric, so you freeze and then you cautiously start to explore. And then it's imagistic. You start making imaginal representations, metaphoric representations, dramatic representations of what might constitute the unknown. 
and then those representations are practiced and implemented in the world and they become more and more fine-grained and automatized and as that happens the locale that they're represented in in the brain shifts from right to left so 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 the reason I'm telling you all this is because you know this is where the metaphysical and the physical unite and this is the sort of argument that I was trying to make to Sam Harris and hopefully we'll be able to continue doing that because I'm going to meet him three times in the next few months so that the the yin yang idea the chaos order idea is metaphorical in some sense to say that the world is made up of order and chaos doesn't sound like an empirical statement but strangely enough the world to which our brains are adapted is actually the world of chaos and order you can think about it as unexplored and explored territory too that's another that's another you know take on it and so then you think from a darwinian perspective think about it this way from a darwinian perspective there's an there's an, an axiomatic presupposition, and that is reality is that which selects. Okay? Reality is the force that selects over evolutionary time. And so the force that selects over evolutionary time has selected for hemispheric specialization, bilateral hemispheric specialization, which indicates that two different modes of looking at the world are necessary for survival, right? So that's real. And so the idea that the world is made out of chaos and order is perhaps the most real idea. Now, here's something else cool that's associated with that. And this is an antidote to nihilism. I also think it's an antidote to, to what would you call, um, ideological, ideological possession. So, when you encounter something unknown, you orient towards it. And that's an involuntary response. You could even think about it as a deterministic response. It's part of what orients you very rapidly towards predators so that they don't kill you before you have a chance to respond. Okay, so you react because the anomalous thing is meaningful. It's intrinsically meaningful. And the reaction is first, terror, with perhaps an overlay of disgust, and second, curiosity. And it's terror so that you freeze and remain paralyzed. You turn to stone when you look at the basilisk or the snake or the gorgon. You turn to stone. You're paralyzed like a prey animal. And that's so the prey predator can't see you, at least in part. And there's other elements of the orienting reflex that are associated with predator avoidance. And then if nothing additionally terrible happens, you start to thaw out and you start to explore. And you do that with image first and, and, then, pra and then practice the appropriate behaviors and then, and then automate those. Now, look, here's the thing that's cool. So that orienting reflex to the unknown is it's an admixture of threat, fear, and curiosity incentive reward so negative emotion and positive emotion now and it's dose dependent the larger the anomaly which means the larger the map it blows out when it manifests itself think of the difference between being irritated at your uh, marital partner because they you know um, oh who knows because they were late to pick you up for work compared to how irritated you would be if you found out they were having an affair difference in size of anomaly the first one disrupts a tiny little part of your space-time orientation, and the second one demolishes your past, present, and future. And the larger the disruption, the more negative emotion, obviously. And so, so there's this weird interplay between negative and positive emotion in the response to anomaly. And, but it's deeply meaningful, even if, it's, even if it paralyzes you, even if it's terrifying, it's meaningful. And then that transforms perhaps into intense curiosity and you start to explore. Now, the phenomena of meaning is a manifestation of the complex orienting reflex. And so you're wired so that you're not just order and you're not just chaos. You're order continually confronting chaos so that the order remains updated. And you might say, well, how do you know how much chaos you should confront in order to keep the order continually updated? And the answer is meaning see something is meaningful the reason that something is meaningful is because you're getting a deep instinctual signal that you're encountering anomaly at a rate that doesn't exceed your capability that's also the rate at which you can keep yourself updated optimally and so meaning isn't epiphenomenal and it and it isn't it isn't some kind of delusion that rationality can and should overcome to say well everything's meaningless it's like no it's not meaning is the most fundamental instinct for adaptation and so that's partly why in 12 Rules for Life, I said one of the rules, um, I think it's rule seven, is do what is meaningful, not what is expedient. Because meaning is a really good guide to long-term adaptation. And so then, and the other thing about meaning, 
which is what happens when you get the balance between chaos and order right, is that meaning is the antidote to despair. And so if you, and there's all sorts of reasons in life to be desperate. And so if you immerse yourself in meaning, you can learn to do that. You can learn to do that. You can make that goal your highest goal. And so then the highest goal would be to be the sort of mythological hero, let's say, to embody and incarnate and imitate the mythological hero, like the imitation of Christ, which is what you're called to do if you happen to be Christian. That means that you live in meaning, and that meaning is the antidote to the suffering of life that would otherwise make you brutal and vengeful and unhappy and miserable, and like that, that young guy who just mowed down 12 people in Toronto. These are real things. You lose your sense of meaning. You end up in hell, and in hell you do all sorts of terrible things. These are, these are dreadful realities, and it isn't as if they're not grounded in the appropriate science. So, anyways, that was also a very complicated question. Being gay and in a long-term relationship, we are considering kids. What are your thoughts about gay people raising children? Um, I think the devil's in the details, to tell you the truth. When If I was ever talking to any individuals about that, that's it. the question is, well, how would you raise them? I mean, you have problems, right? If you're both of the same sex, then you're going to have the problem of how to provide the proper model for, you know, let's say you have a boy and a girl. Um, you, we know this is indisputable, and this is something I've talked to Warren Farrell about. Kids in intact heterosexual families where the father is present do way better on multiple indices than kids who are are part of single parent families. Now that doesn't mean that there are no single parents who do a good job, right? That's not the same bloody claim. Those are different claims. Uh, but on average, kid not only do kids where fathers are present do better, but societies or even even local societies where there are more fathers present do better, not only for the kids that they're fathering, but the kids in the neighborhood where there are lots of intact families with fathers do better. And so I believe quite firmly that the nuclear family is the smallest viable human unit. Father, mother, child. F smallest viable unit. And if you fragment it below that, then you end up paying. Now, that that doesn't mean that there are way there aren't ways that you can operate in a smaller unit or a different unit effectively but you have to contend with the fact that it's necessary for peop for kids to have models for both sexes and that means that means accepting that the sexes are different even though there's a fair overlap between them accepting that they're different and that both sexes play their role it looks like what fathers do, and I talked to Warren Farrell a lot about this, and I'm going to release this video this month, about what fathers do. And a lot of what they do is rough and tumble play with the kids, which kids really, really, really like. And it's really important, as Jak Panksepp, a great affective neuroscientist, laid out in his studies on rats. He discovered the play circuitry. And fathers, this is something Farrell told me, which was extraordinarily interesting, is that fathers use the joy of the possibility of play as a scaffold to help children learn to delay gratification. So imagine a father spends a bunch of time playing with his kids and they're having a great old time. They're wrestling around and pushing each other's limits to find out where they are and, and learning the physiological dance that goes along with direct contact, direct exciting contact, learning what hurts and what doesn't and what constitutes fair play and what isn't and how everybody can play and still enjoy the game and how excited you could get before it's too much and how much you should watch and how much you shouldn't and when you can object to being hurt all of that at a deeply embodied level the kids love that they'll line up for that and Panksepp demonstrated very clearly that rats will work to play and that rats play fair and they learn to play fair because of iterated play bouts and that if you don't let juvenile male rats play then their prefrontal cortexes don't develop and they get attention deficit disorder or the equivalent in rats and then you can treat that with Ritalin and so this is all very vital material. Now, if you're going to, if you if you're gay, let's say there's two two men or two women, then you have the problem of what you're going to do for the contra sexual um, target. And you can say, well, it doesn't matter because there's no differences between men and women. And you can gerrymander the damn question that way and avoid your moral responsibility. Or you can face it squarely and say, look, you've decided to step outside of the cultural norm and to organize a non-standard relationship, which puts a tremendous responsibility on you. 
and then you have to figure out how you can provide for your children what it is that they would get in the classic minimal human unit. So, and more power to you. I hope you can do a good job of it. You know, I, I think there's room in the world for, for a diverse range of approaches to complex life problems like, like having kids and finding a partner. But that doesn't mean you get to bury your head in the sand about the absolute realities of life and the fact that there are biological differences between men and women. To deny that is, is reprehensible in my estimation. I, and, and besides, the empirical data, the scientific data are crystal clear. So, and it, so... Okay, Carl Jung says that everything unconscious is projected into reality. How do you know if you are perceiving reality accurately or are just projecting? Great, yeah, well, that's partly why I'm a pragmatist. Well, there's a bunch of ways. Um, there's a bunch of ways that you know. Pain tells you. If you make a mistake and you hurt yourself, well, then your stupid theory was wrong, right? That's what the pain says. Your stupid theory was wrong. And that's a pragmatic, you see, that's another indication of pragmatic theory of truth. You lay out, look, when you look at the world, you look at the world with a set of presuppositions. I outlined that in chapter 10 in, in, rules, in 12 Rules for Life called Be Precise in Your Speech. It, it indicates that when you look at the world, you look at it through a value structure. You can't help that because you're always aiming at something in the world and you're always aiming at something you want and you're trying to get it. And so that means that you look at the world through a value structure. Now the question is whether or not that value structure is valid. And that's a very complicated question. Okay, so how do you know if it's valid? Number one, you lay it out and you act it out. You, you implement it perceptually and then you act it out. And if you get what you wanted, what the theory predicted, that's another way of thinking about it, but wanted is a better way of thinking about it, then the fact that that behavioral routine and perceptual structure produced the intended result validates it as a tool for obtaining that result, and that's a form of truth. Now, it might be the only form of truth, although I'm not convinced of that completely, but it might be. It's a very complicated question. Now, how do you know if your stupid theory is wrong? Okay, A, it fails, and you're hurt. Pain tells you, you pragmatically, your theory was wrong. So that's why you should pay attention to your own pain, because your suffering is indication that you still have things to learn. And maybe the suffering of other people is also that. Um, maybe something unexpected or unpredictable happens when you're laying out your plan, and then the anomalous manifests itself, the unexpected or chaos, and then you get anxious. Well, anxiety is an indication that your plan, your arrow didn't fly to its mark, so you aimed wrong. And that might mean a small error, you know, maybe a, a tiny adjustment of your bow, or it might mean you just don't know what the hell you're doing at all and everything is lost. And so anxiety tells you if your theory is wrong. And then, and then other people tell you that, and that's why you want to surround yourself with other people. Because you distribute your cognitive resource, you, you, you distribute your problems to the cognitive resources of the social group. That's what we do when we price things, right? Everyone votes on the price of something because it's so difficult, because the price of something has to be established in relationship to the price of everything else, and that's always in flux, and so it's com computationally impossible problem, and so we outsource it to the market, which is the free cognitive decision of, of millions of people, and that's how we determine price. And so one of the things you do to make sure that you're not any stupider than you have to be, blind, ignorant, biased, and all of that, is you surround yourself with other people, and you try to treat them well enough so that they can tolerate you, and then every time that you do something stupid, because one of your theories is, in, is vague or incomplete or wrong or biased or you're willfully blind, then they slap you on the side of the head. They ignore you because you're boring. They don't laugh at your jokes because they're stupid. They, they, they are irritated at your actions because you're not taking your own long-term interests or the interests of other people into account. And so you have pain, you have anxiety, you have the reward of success, that, that's, that's a positive indicator that your theory is okay, and then you have the reactions of everyone else. And if you're clued in, you pay attention to all of those things, and you try to update your, your order, which is your perceptions, you try to update your order constantly as a consequence of being humble in the face of your errors, which is why humility is the precondition for learning and why it's one of the highest moral virtues. So, and perceiving reality accurately. You don't really perceive reality, and you don't really perceive accurately. You perceive small, 
portions of reality, extraordinarily limited in space and time, and accurately means well enough so that when you do what you're doing, it works. That's why I'm a pragmatist. I mean, not only. I mean, you know, I mean, there's lots of other philosophical streams that have influenced my thought, existentialism, phenomenolo phenomenology, to mention two others. Um, but the thing is, you can't perceive reality accurately because you don't know everything. So, and you're full of biases and, and you're ignorant as hell. And so the best you can do is perceive small bits of reality well enough so that you can more or less get what you need in a relatively short period of time without screwing yourself up too badly in the medium to long term. That's pretty much what you've got. And, and that doesn't mean truth is impossible. It just means that it's very, very complicated to decide what truth is. And because the question is, what is truth for someone whose knowledge is limited? Right? Because obviously, because your knowledge is limited and you don't know everything, say in some fundamental way, you're ignorant or wrong about everything. But that doesn't help because you still have to act in the world. So there are bounded truths. There are bounded truths. And so, all right. If past experiences shape us, oh, no, I missed one. You cite a tired brain, foggy thinking, as the reason to stop answering questions or giving a talk. How do you combat this while working or writing daily? Um, well, I eat a big breakfast relatively soon on waking. That really helps. If any of you out there are anxious, and many of you no doubt are, there'll be a large number of you who are anxious and don't eat breakfast and there'll be a whole bunch of you out there who think well i don't eat breakfast it isn't necessary it's like that's wrong it's necessary you fasted all night if you load yourself